Hello, everyone. Welcome to another video for History Valley Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Rabbi Tovia Singer, and today we're going to be discussing Christians getting the Jewish Messiah wrong, Christians misinterpreting the Old Testament, and saying all kinds of stuff, trying to trying to make it seem that their Jesus or their version of the Messiah is is found in the Old Testament. So, welcome back to the show, Rabbi Singer. Well, great to be back, Jacob. Thank you. Christians believe that the Jewish Messiah, who they assume is the same person as Jesus Christ, will override the Old Covenant and replace it with a new one. Does the Jewish text ever describe the Jewish Messiah as bringing a new covenant when he comes? Okay, that's very interesting. So let's start right from the get-go. What Christians and Jews share in common is that word Messiah but we mean something completely different. They have nothing in common. The Hebrew Bible described the Messiah in passages like Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, that he'll rebuke many nations. He will judge among the peoples. That's what Mashiach is. The Messiah is an heir to the throne of David. In Christianity, he's a person running around doing miracles and then dying for everyone's sins and then rising on the third day and if you believe in that dying and rising God figure, then you're saved. And if not, you're damned to hell. There's nothing remotely resembling any of that in the Hebrew Bible. It's, it's quite the contrary. Human sacrifice is condemned repeatedly throughout the Hebrew scriptures. Now, let's talk about the covenant part. So Christians believe and they've been taught this since their children, that their beliefs are the fulfillment of the Hebrew Bible. Why? Because the Christian Bible says so. Where? Luke 24, 44 through 46. Well, the author of the third gospel has the audacity to claim that if you just look in the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms, which means the writings, you will find a prophecy of the Messiah dying and rising on the third day. I'm going to assume that whoever wrote the book of Luke got that from an earlier book from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. These, these, this kind of prophecy is found nowhere in the Hebrew Bible. If we're in the Hebrew Bible, everyone would be, every Jew would be a Christian. We'd all be in church right now. There's nothing remotely resembling it. In fact, when Paul says that Jesus rose on the third day according to the scripture, there is no scripture. There's no scripture like it. Okay. New covenant. So Christians use the term new covenant based on passages in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse, essentially verse 8, 9, all the way through verse 13. That's how the chapter ends. The book of Hebrews is an epistle written in the mid-60s, probably 64, as an argument against Judaism. It's 13 chapters of an attack, an assault on the Jewish faith, that in fact this new religion, the author doesn't call Christianity, but that's what he has in mind, supersedes that Jesus above the angels, above Moses, Joshua, He's a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. He is our Sabbath, Hebrews 4. The whole point of Hebrews is that, that Christianity, not a term in vogue at the time, but Christianity replaces Judaism. And the old covenant in the view of Hebrews is the covenant made through the law. It's a covenant made through a, a, a pronomian covenant, meaning a covenant that was made through ritual uh, commandments has been superseded. He violently misquotes the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah talks about a new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 30, 31, depending if he's a Jewish or Christian Bible. Jeremiah is describing a time when the, in the Messianic age, well, God will renew a promise. 
The word covenant doesn't mean a Torah, doesn't mean a law, doesn't mean so, doesn't mean any of that. The word covenant means exactly what you think it means. It means a promise. That's it. Doesn't say I'll make a new Torah, a new commandments. No. Jeremiah is telling us that days are coming, saith the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with Yehuda Israel. That means a restored uh, people, the northern and southern kingdom. And it's not going to be like the old covenant. The old covenant is the covenant when the Jews were taken out of out of Egypt, brought to the land of Israel. It's not according to that because not that I did anything wrong, God is saying, but you betrayed me. No, you, you broke that covenant, meaning you weren't loyal to God and therefore you were exiled. The passage says, although I was a husband to you, so I was like your lover. Like, why did you do that to me? This is going to be very, very important. Because as it turns out, the Christian Bible has to replace this. <laughs> they not only have to replace the covenant, but they have to replace the actual words itself. If you go to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8 utterly changes this. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 8 verse 9. You won't even believe what you're about to read. And Hebrews 8 says, it's quoting Jeremiah 31. He says, I will make a new covenant with the Israel house of Judah, not like the old covenant I made on the day when I took them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I rejected them. I'm not kidding. Take Hebrews chapter 8, verse 9, compare it to Jeremiah 30 and 30, 31, verse 30, 31, depending on which kind of Bible you're using, and just put them side by side. You could do it with two browsers. Just put them side by side. So in the Jewish, in the Hebrew Bible, it's going to say, although I was a husband to you, I was Baalti, and that term that I was your husband is used earlier in Jeremiah as God's relationship with the children of Israel. So the author of Hebrews, whoever it was, it wasn't Paul, but it was someone who followed Pauline thinking, removed the words, I was a husband to you, and replaced them, I rejected you. So there you have the real replacement. And then it gets crazier. And if you're not sure that my hermeneutic, my reading of this text is that God is done with the Jewish covenant, with the covenant with the Jew. If, if you're not sure that I'm accurately characterizing what Hebrews is saying, go to the last verse of the entire chapter, verse 13. For when he said a new covenant, what did he do? He made the first one obsolete. When Hebrews 8.13 is saying that, He's referring to the old covenant based on the law. He's talking about Israel. He's talk that's why they call it the Old Testament. Same word, Testament covenant. Not kidding. And whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old disappears. And I, I say this to you, you know, I, maybe you, the viewer, think that Rabbi Singer has an unfavorable view of Christian teachings, and maybe I'm mischaracterizing the book of Hebrews. I implore you to consider looking this up. And you have to ask the question, how did whoever wrote Hebrews change what it says in Jeremiah 31? It says, I was a husband, changed to, I rejected you. How do you play with the Bible? What do you, what do you are you insane? So Jeremiah is telling us, here's what Jeremiah, the, the message. What is the covenant? The covenant is a promise. That means I'm bringing you back. You're going to be restored back to the land of Israel, never to be rejected again, never to be thrown out again. See Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11, 12, 13. That's the whole end of, Je of Isaiah chapter 11. The whole end of Isaiah chapter 11 is all about the restoring of the children of Israel back to the land of Israel. And the northern tribe will work together with the southern tribe, and Judah and Ephraim will be together, will act in unison. That's how Isaiah, Isaiah 11 should make your head spin because that's a, an ecstatic messianic chapter. I, I just released a video on that on, on YouTube very, very recently at a lecture I gave in Jerusalem. So 
Jeremiah is saying, look, you were thrown out of the land of Israel because you broke the covenant, and so they told us it's going to happen to you, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. But you're going to come back again. You're going to be stirred back to the land of Israel. And please go back to Jeremiah 31. In those days, verse 33, in those days, if you want to be sure, this is not talking about anything that happened in the time of Christianity. In those days, no one is going to have to teach his neighbor about God, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. Well, that didn't happen in the time of Jesus, did it? So if Jesus ushered in a new covenant, then none of this was fulfilled. The text says that this will be a time where everyone will know about God. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. Isaiah chapter 11, same chapter, a little earlier, verse 9. Right there, the whole point of Zechariah 14, 9 is that everybody knows it. That's the whole point. So in this period, in this epoch, everyone will know about God, and my job as a rabbi, I'm going to be unemployed. I have nothing. I don't have to do it anymore. And then the text continues, and it says, So said the Lord who created the sun to limit the day, the moon, the stars, the night. If these laws will pass before me, if the very foundations of the earth can be measured, so too will I cast off the children of Israel, the seed of Jacob, from being a nation. Which means the Bible is saying nothing could ever happen to the Jews. They're going to go through all kinds of stuff, but they're going to be restored back to the land. Jeremiah 30, verse 3. I mean, you, your head should be spinning because it's, it's the same messianic text. Jeremiah 33, the Jews are going to return back to the land of Israel again at the end of the days. Jeremiah 37, Jacob's trouble. This is very rich, famous stuff. I mean, this is like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. If you don't know, know that, you know, you, this, is, this, is, this is the meat. So the covenant is a promise that has nothing to do with the Torah. Nothing. Christians think it, it does, not because they're bad people. This is what they're taught every Sunday, that we're under a new covenant, and the word covenant for the Christian just takes on a meaning that has nothing to do with the Hebrew Bible. The covenant there is a promise. What promise? That the Jews will be torn back to land. What about the old covenant? The old covenant, the Jews broke. What does that mean? They don't have to keep Sabbath anymore? Of course not. It means that they um, they are going to be returned back to the land of Israel. Nothing about In fact, in Ezekiel 37, 24, 25, the Jews are going to be keeping all the Torah when the Messiah comes. So they they just wreck. It's like a train wreck. And how uh, how is the relationship between God and me? Me and the Pope? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's not going well at all. But I'm working on it. We're working on it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> but the but God and the Jewish Messiah, because Christians will say, well, because of the Trinity relationship, the Trinian relationship between Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, God is the Messiah technically because Jesus is God and the Go for the Old Testament, quote a verse from Genesis 1, uh, 126, others in Genesis 18, 1 and 2, and say, okay, the Old Testament seems to be, the Hebrew Bible seems to portray God as three different people. Like when Abraham looks up, uh, when when he looks up at the Lord, in Genesis 18, 1 to 2, it says, behold, he saw three men. And so a Christian looks and says, oh, Trinity, God's three different right. people. Shlosha Anoshim, Genesis 18, means three men, right? And those three men, you are to believe, are referring to the, the Trinity. There are the three gods. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Why don't you just go to concordance and look up the word three, and every time it comes up, just put in Trinity. So... Right, so it collapses really bad, hard, fast. So they're saying that the three men that appear to Abraham were, were the three hypostatic entities of the hypostatic union of the Trinity. Lovely. Doesn't work. Genesis chapter 19. So instead of going to Genesis 18, let's keep going to 19. And just so you know, 18 and 19 are a continual story. All right, two of the angels leave uh, Abraham's presence and go to Sodom. How do you know I'm not making that up? Please, please open Genesis 19, verse 1. 
So Genesis 18, 1 and 2, but we seem to have forgotten about Genesis 19, 1 and 2. Those are angels. They're not hypostatic entities. They're not the Spirit and Jesus going down to... Now, where do Christians get in so much trouble? You can get in trouble here. If you're not reading Hebrew and you're not reading the entire Tanakh well, there is a... There's an unconventional way of conveying information in the Hebrew Bible. I mean, we would never do that today. But in the Jewish p scriptures, an angel can be called God. A prophet can be called God. And it's just interchangeable. A judge sitting in a Jewish court, see Exodus 21 and 22, literally is called Elohim. When Moses pleads with God, I'm just not up to delivering the children of Israel. I, I, his last argument, I'm an Orel Sifasayim. I have a speech impediment. That's how Genesis, excuse me, Exodus chapter 6 ends, right? Exodus 7, once God says to, to Moses, okay, you will be a God to Pharaoh and Aaron, who did not have a speech problem, he'll be your prophet. I mean, he'll talk on your behalf. Doesn't mean Moses was God, Right, so that can be exploited. But to chasrei meat melihim, you made him a little lower than even the Book of Hebrews quotes that a little lower than the angels. The text says God, so people can get into a lot of trouble, and Christians can exploit these texts because no one talks that way today. No one would refer to an angel today as God in Tanakh. It is so you got to be very careful. And in case you're wondering, you know, those, those angels are interchangeable with God, see Genesis 19, 13, and 14. We see explicitly, I mean, who is destroying Sodom? Who? God or the angel? Well, it depends. The angel is doing what God sends him to do. The word angel in Hebrew is malach, which means a messenger. It's the same word. It's the same word, angelos. That's where the word angel comes from. It means a messenger. So when the messenger does it, it's God is doing it. So it's a horrible idea. If you want to prove the doctrine of the Trinity, you are much better off quoting from the, from the minutes of the Council of Nicaea, from the Nicene Creed. There you have the doctrine of Trinity. You have a much wiser idea to appeal to a corrupt text like First John Chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, go to that. Don't use Genesis 18 and 19. That's not friendly territory. So when the Jewish Messiah is supposed to come, is he given power by God, great power, Yeah. Um, take over vast lands? And it, it, is there also an Armageddon that's supposed to happen? Or... Is this a Christian exaggeration of that Armageddon when it, when it comes to something like Revelation, for example? The term Armageddon, which appears in the book of Revelation, is just whoever wrote the book of Revelation, whatever is, his name is John. I believe that. Uh, he just didn't know what he was doing. I don't, I'm not trying, I probably should have been, he's dead, so I can say what I want. No, I, <laughs> he just misquoted the text. Um, he misquoted Har Megiddo. Har Megiddo is in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 and 11, where at the end of days, at the end of days, there's going to be someone killed in war, in the final war, where the Jews defeat their enemies. Please read chapter 12 in context. But someone gets killed in the battle, context, Zechariah 8. 12 verse 8 and 9 and the Jews they'll be as strong as like the angels even like David they'll be they'll defeat their enemies but someone gets killed in the battle which is a tragedy and everyone's mourning and they will look to me because of the one who was pierced through who was killed and they will mourn over him as one mourns over firstborn son and then what the past six inches say, and it will be like what happened in the Valley of Megiddo. What happened in the Valley of Megiddo? What's Tanakh talking about? Tanakh does this all the time. If you want to know what's going to happen in the future, you remember that event? Okay, in the Valley of Megiddo is where Yoshiahu, Josiah, the last of the great Davidic kings, he was a just fabulous man, died young, killed in battle. He died and the nation was mourning over him. It, it triggered a repentance. That's where Revelation takes this from. 
completely misquoted. That's where our war room again. So they misidentify it. But there is an end time war where nations come up against the Jewish people who are back in the land of Israel. And the people in Israel then defeat all their enemies around them. So it's Isaiah 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Everyone agrees this is the Messiah because it clearly is. A shoot will come out of Jesse. Upon him, God will place on him the spirit of the Almighty. What kind of spirit is this? So it's Ruach Chachma, which means he's going to give a spirit of knowledge, Ubina, understanding, reveres Hashem, and he will fear God. That means this, why did the text passage end? This is Isaiah 11 2. Because if someone else, an ordinary person, would receive such an ability of understanding perception, remember what he has to do? He has to judge people. He's going to fear God. He's not going to become full of himself. Vaharicha beers Hashem, verse 3, means he'll be imbued, but it's really a play on the word ruach. It's really like Isaiah's use of the Hebrew language is unparalleled. What a gorgeous word that is. He will be imbued like in the fear of God, and he won't judge people after the sight of his eyes. Does sound Christian to you? No. No, nothing. He's not going to heal lepers and schmeppers and blind people and and spitting in people's eyes and none of that stuff. There's nothing like that. And according to the sight of his eyes, he will not judge anyone or he will not judge people on the way they hear. You can go to court. You have two people going to court, right? One person is a very attractive, wealthy person with a fancy Rolex. And then the person's walking in and he's wearing a schmata from made in... Walmart some, right? So uh, the guy who's wearing clothing coming out of Walmart, nothing has Walmart, but whatever it is, compared to the other guy, he's dressed, looks like Neiman Marcus. One guy has a gorgeous British accent, Queen's English, and the other guy sounds like he's from Brooklyn, right? So that's what the text says. It's not going to affect the Mashiach. The Mashiach is going to judge properly. This is a play on earlier on in Isaiah where God chastises bad behaving Jews for judging people in a unbalanced fashion. People who are weak are judged differently than people who are wealthy. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 23. I mean the Jews get it. So that's the whole point. There's nothing Christian. There's no Christian voice here. So that's it. That's what he is. I know it's for all of you who are exposed to all these Jesus movies, you're going, really? That's it? That's it. There's just going to be justice in the world. That's it. None of that. Does that mean he won't do a miracle? I don't know. The Tanakh doesn't seem to feel that's important at all. There's no mention of that. And for those of you who've read the Gospels, if you have, you know I'm telling the truth. If you haven't, you could take my word for it. Look it up yourself. You read the Gospels. The moment Jesus starts doing anything, he's doing miracles. That's it. It's just basically it's miracle straight through. In Mark, he gets baptized and just miracle, 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 and then passion narrative. You know, that's it. Matthew, infancy narrative, miracle, 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 miracle. That's all he's doing. He's doing miracles everywhere. Healing. That's it. And it's very attractive. It's like Superman in the comics. It's very, that's what he is. It's what it is. And he's like, whoa, this guy is amazing. And he looks great. Well, that's <laughs> looks bad. that's what's going on. There's nothing resembling. That. That's why I say that people seem to think that Christianity is just a different orientation than Judaism. It's not. It's totally different. And, and if, if man was going to invent the Messiah, he would invent Jesus. You would want someone who looks better than you'll ever look, who is more in control than you'll ever be, who's just can do miracles and have says the perfect thing at the perfect time. He's uh, you know the person we. That's it. It's it's man's idea of what God would look like in the flesh. Judaism is a story about God engaging in the adventure of creating man in His image. Just the opposite. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.